miracle is defined as an event remarkable in that it goes contrary to the laws of nature, that is, to the usual course of events. The difference between science and religion simply is that science attempts to explain how things happen, but through religion and faith, we understand why things happen. In other words, you want to be able to know a little bit of both, but most importantly, you need to know that science can't get you into heaven. Many people remember the story of Nimrod in Genesis, where Nimrod was a great king and a great military leader, and he built the Tower of Babel because he was trying to construct an edifice that could be a highway unto God. The Bible says that the, God confused the people's language and therefore they weren't able to communicate with each other. They scattered among the lands. This was why that we have different languages even unto this day. This is why when you don't understand what somebody's saying, they call it babbling. Amen. So when we understand as people of faith that our faith explains that God is the source of everything and that all things come from God, we will approach the debate about miracles from a totally different perspective. Miracles is find the direct action of God or some other being whose existence lies outside the natural universe and is assumed to be the cause of miracles so that they are commonly taken as an attestation of the claimed divine origin of message or messenger. Biblical miracles are never just conjuring tricks, but are bound up with the work of God in history for his people's salvation with the understanding and acceptance of his message. As such, each is in some way a sign that God is in the midst. The Bible teaches us that there are two types of miracles. The first type of miracle is one that is called type one. This is the one that is a disruption of the natural order of nature. When God led his people to the Red Sea and Moses stretched out his rod and the sea parted and the people walked through on dry ground, this was a disruption of time and the natural order of things. The second type of miracle is called type two. This is the case that's in our story today where God disrupts the cause and effect relationship as it relates to human beings. See, when leprosy takes over your body, the flesh begins to die and it becomes corrupt. But when Jesus steps in and say, go show yourselves to the priest, the Bible says as they went, they were healed. When was the last time that you got healed on the way to CV? Yes. Uh, what is the last time you got healed on your way to Walgreens or on your way to the doctor's office? That is a, a disruption of a cause and effect relationship as it relates to you, the believer. God performs miracles every day, not only for those who don't believe, but also for those who do believe. Miracles imply unlimited possibilities. Science places limits on the possibility of, of outcomes, but miracles allow God to do the impossible in our lives. Somebody is dealing with a situation that according to science, uh, you shouldn't be here today. Somebody is dealing with a situation that according to people's public opinion, you should not be standing in the midst today. But because you know that we serve a miracle working God, that the virgin birth is not only possible, but it will be done because God is in the midst. Somebody asked the question today, how do we respond to the impossible with faith? God wants us as a church to believe that faith empowers us to overcome impossibilities. You are like that bumblebee that's not supposed to be able to fly. You are one who beats the odds and you are a daring impossibility that has been made a living possibility. Declaring impossibilities is about placing boundaries on how things work in order for people to understand. Philosophers call it reductionist theory. That's when you break things down to smaller parts in order for people to understand. There's a story about a man that wanted to buy a Cadillac and he went to the dealership and the dealer told him that he could sell it to him for about $400 per month. The man began to complain and say that was too much money and the dealer began to rework the figures and he said, I can give it to you for $100 a week. And the man said, I'll take it. 
Touch his neighbor and say, you got to break it down. This is why science it takes place because science is a means of breaking things down for people, human minds to understand it so we can put things and even people in categories in terms of wealthy, middle class, and poor. These fictive scientific categories that only exist in the minds of man because the Bible says that God is infinite in wisdom and what a man if we are not mindful of him. So as believers we do not look at the world through scientific eyes first. We look through the world and to the world through eyes of believers in the hand of our almighty God. In this story today, impossibilities are now made possible because we understand as human beings, not just as Christians, that life is complicated. Touch your neighbor say it's complicated. We are complex people. We are complex organisms. We are made up as an assembly of parts and we're working sometimes even against our own creation. People commit suicide. People hurt themselves and harm not only themselves or others. A man in Pennsylvania killed his wife, his wife's sister, his wife's mother, and even himself instead of just harming himself. This is what hurt people do when they don't know God. Hurt people hurt other people. But when you understand that even a, a mean man that will kill his wife and her entire family, that when God gets in his heart, God can turn things around. Luke chapter 1 records the story of two miracles, the conception of Elizabeth and Zacharias in their old age, but also the immaculate conception. The word immaculate means that it's beyond human reason, that it's of a divine nature, that God conceived a virgin by the name of Mary to fulfill the prophecy by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter number 9, for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given this will not just be a child but it will be a male child which is destined to be a leader not only of his family but of God's universal family you remember the story when Jesus was teaching and his family and his friends and his neighbors but most importantly his mother were waiting outside to see him and Jesus said who is my mother my sister and my brother that they that do the will of the Father. The same is my mother, sister, and brother. Jesus was not abandoning his immediate family, but he was opening up the door of what his real purpose was for us to have unity in the universal family. Somebody asked the question is, when are all of us going to get along? There was a story told when men went up to heaven and they came up to St. Peter. He said, you have to answer Three, be three questions and if I can't answer the question uh, then you can come on in. Uh, the first man asked Peter what's uh, 100 times uh, 100,000 uh, and Peter said uh, 100 billion uh, and the man came on in. The second man uh, asked the question who was the leader in the war of 1066 and he said uh, William Duke of Normandy. Uh, then the black man came up and asked him that. he said where are all black folks uh, going to get together? Uh, and Peter said don't Ask me nothing I can't give you the answer to. Just name say all things are possible with God. The reason why we can't come together is because we try to come together on our own terms. We try to come together with a five-finger discount. We always coming together with the hookup in mind, not taking God and his word and letting his word lead to be the foundation of the relationship. You got some people that you know that they want things to work the way that they want them to work, but they have not prayed unto God to ask for his will to be done in that situation, in every situation. When things are who seem impossible are made possible, it's when the grace of God falls upon our hearts and opens our eyes that we begin to see that life is more than about what we get on December 25th or what we give on December 25th. Life is about serving and loving an almighty and all wise God. 
Somebody here is worried about how their situation is going to turn around. But God teaches us in his word that if any man seeks wisdom, let him ask of God. Mary was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. And what an honor it is to be chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. The, the promised prophet, priest, and king uh, foretold by Isaiah and others uh, to lead Israel from oppression uh, into a world uh, of prosperity. God uh, has told Mary through an angel by the name of Gabriel uh, that she would give birth to a son and his name should be called Jesus Mary humbly submitted to the Lord and had the faith that he would keep his promise and her decision would bring her sorrow because if a virgin were to be conceived before being betrothed to a man in marriage, she could even be stoned to death. Joseph did not have to believe her story that this was a Holy Ghost baby, but an angel of God in Matthew chapter 2 tells us that he was spoke to Joseph in a dream and told her that this child told her that this child was a child of God she was blessed among all women because the grace that God had given to her so as we lead into impossibilities we need to pray that grace goes before us that grace leads us and that grace will keep us in the midst of what seems impossible I know that your money is funny and your change is strange but look at our forefathers and what they took is nothing and made something it was because of the grace of God. I know your situation seems unreal and surreal, but looking at it through the eyes of God, your ending is going to be better than your beginning. All things are possible to those who believe. All who trust Christ and his word and trust him as their savior are highly graced by the Lord. The first lesson in our story today is, is that we need to thank God for grace. Touch your name and say, thank God for grace. We thank God for verse 30 that teaches us that in the story that the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Touch your name and say, you found favor with God. Now many of you know that it's not just a cliche, but favor is not fair. If we are where we should be according to science, uh, we should not be alive today because according to evolution theory the, the natural selection has weeded out uh, different organisms and beings because of their inability to adapt uh, to changes in the environment uh, and so uh, simple cell organisms uh, and, uh, and simple cell uh, bacteria and all types of, of cultures of beings no longer exist according to the theory of evolution uh, because they were unable to adapt uh, to the surrounding changes of their environment. But you can look at the church, and if it was according to this theory, the church should no longer be here. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki's of the postmodern world should have wiped us out. We should be dead because of anthrax, HIV, and all other types of diseases. We should not be here because of the swine flu, the bird flu, and even the old-fashioned flu. You should have not been here a long time ago. Because when you were at the strip club or the nightclub and somebody got to shooting up, that bullet had a name on it. But if it had not been for the grace of God, you would not be here today. That's what they say, I'm a survivor. And the reason that you're still here is not because of some scientific equation or some misplacement of a misfit of a cosmic explosion. You're here because the grace of God has favored your life. The word favor means kindness. It means gift. It means goodwill. And this is why science will never be able to answer some complex questions about human existence because science is only designed to tell us how things happen. A plus B equals C and so forth. There's a mathematical reasoning to the existence of empirical evidence. But that brings upon limitations because if I really want to know why I'm going through what I'm going through, I'm not going 
going to find out in a mathematical equation. Well, the way I'm going to find out, instead of just having some theology, I need to have some neology. And when I get down on my knees, the Lord will tell me about the favor of God. Abraham and Sarah can tell you about the favor of God. Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't just need Gabriel to tell them. They could have just read the word of God and seen how Abraham believed God. And he accounted it to, unto him for righteousness. Because Zechariah did not believe the word when he first received it. The Bible says that he could not speak. And sometimes silence is necessary in order to prepare us to really appreciate the grace of God. Look at say sometimes you need to shut up. The problem is, is many of us talk too much while God is trying to talk to us. So when we say thank God for grace, I don't really need an explanation of why you did what you did when you did what you did. When I understand that it's what caused the grace of God that he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. And because he looked beyond my faults, through the eyes of grace, I can look beyond yours. Look at your neighbor and say, I ain't no better than you. Thank God for grace because God did not choose Elizabeth and Zechariah because they were perfect people. He did not choose Mary because she was perfect. He chose her because he, she had found favor in the Lord. Because of the grace of God is how we can do or become anything that we are. Because if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? Secondly, we have to trust God for guidance. Just the neighbor say, trust God for guidance. God. Verse 35 tells us that the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One will be born and will be called the Son of God. The word overshadow comes from the Greek word epichromai, which means to come, to draw near, or to arrive. This is why many of us uh, who are saved and have a relationship with God uh, never really mature in our relationship with God because we are like a ship that's without a sail. We're in the water, but we're just floating. We're not really having a sense of direction. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, He is a comforter who will guide you into all truth. Touch your neighbor and say you need some guidance. That's why you don't give a million dollar lottery ticket to a crackhead on the corner. Because without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, He's going to blow all that money in two weeks. But when you give it to somebody who has a heart for God and is led by the Holy Spirit, children will be opening up schools that will teach other children how to read. When we have the Holy Spirit in the midst, people who have cancer will have the Holy Ghost laid hands on them and the cancer will be removed. I don't know if you believe it, I got testimonies on my side of people who are destined to die according to scientific reasoning. The doctor looked at their sheet and x-rays and he shook his head but they can stand on their feet today and it's because of the guidance of the Lord and not the guidance of the doctor I'm still here yeah. 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 look at David said don't give up on me yet God is not through with me yet when you trust God for guidance, you are admitting that it's not about you. It's not about your agenda. It's not even about your expectations. Because many of us give up on things too quickly because things don't turn out the way that we want them to. I'm preaching to somebody here today because you are saved, but the Holy Ghost has not overshadowed you yet. Because you are continuously hitting that brick wall over and over again, waiting on the brick wall to move. And against scientific reasons, we get bumps and bruises on our heads when we keep hitting the brick wall over and over again, waiting for it to move. When you do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, psychiatrists call that insanity. But when you got God in your life, He will overshadow you, so you won't even have to worry about the brick walls that are in your way. Because the Bible says, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Touch neighbor and say, he's leading me. This is why the lesson in the story is so important because we cannot read the story with scientific eyes because all of us who know that one plus one equals one automatically know that that is not a mathematically correct equation. How can one man and one woman come together to make one baby? We know that in school they taught us that one plus one equals two. So ladies, that means if you ever conceived a child before, according to the laws of mathematics, you should always have twins. So when we understand that God is in the equation, things will not work out according to human expectation. This is a miracle story. This is a story about divine intervention. This is a story about God coming in the midst of a situation and changing the thing to be what he wants it to be and not what man wants it to be. If it had turned out man's way, Joseph could have killed Mary when God came upon her and overshadowed her. But when you have the Holy Spirit working on your behalf and a devil in hell can stop what God has in store for you. Trust the Lord in all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. The last point is we have to take God at his word. To the neighbor say take him at his word. The more we begin to look at things from a scientific perspective, the more we indoctrinate ourselves in a world that is simply ruled by cause and effect. And when we indoctrinate ourselves that a world is only moved and used and experienced by cause and effect and causal relationships, we will begin to take an anecdotal approach to how we try to fix other people and conform them into our image. This is why we create myths and expectations upon people because they don't become what we want them to be. When we take the Holy Spirit out of the equation, we begin to create an idolatrous church, a church that becomes what we want it to be and not what God wants it to be. Because if it was up to any of us, we would not allow anybody that looks like us, who is doing better than us, to come in and be a part of what God is doing. Because because so many of us are so jealous of prosperity that we don't believe that God can actually bless somebody more than where he's blessing us. If you can't say amen, you might as well say ouch. Or even somebody who was once a drug addict or an alcoholic who is holding up a sign on the corner that said they will work for food. We don't want that person sitting next to us in church because of how they look or how they smell. But that's not the will of God for us to put people in categories according to what our limited eyes can see. See, when you look at me, you're looking at a gray suit and a red tie. But tell your neighbor, you don't know his story. Listen to what the text says. It says, and consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. God used a practical example of somebody else that he was blessing to help somebody that he was getting ready to bless to understand that the blessing was going to be beyond their imagination. This is why you need to come to church so that you can hear somebody else's testimony because nine times out of ten or even ten times out of ten somebody else in the sanctuary is already going through or is going through what you're going through right now. Look at your neighbor and say, tell your testimony. Right. Text says, for nothing will be impossible with God. The text tells us that Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. This is where you move from the complicated questions of life to becoming back to the simple understanding that it's not our will, but thine will be done. Jesus understood this even after working some 36 miracles in Galilee, in Nazareth, and in Capernaum. He understood that at the end of his journey in Gethsemane, he could not ask God all 
all the complicated questions about what the cup of the chalice really meant. There was a cup that he had on that Thursday night around the table, and that was the one that represented the blood that he would share. But then there was another cup that he saw in the garden that represented the sins of humanity. You just got to take God at his word. I can't tell you all the things that I've ever done wrong in order to get you to believe how good God has been to me. I can't even tell you all the things that I've done right in order for you to believe how good God has been to me. All I got to tell you is, is that God has been good. And some of us who are trying to doubt God scientifically need to get to know God spiritually. And we just need to take him at his word. This is what Mary did when the angel spoke to her. She said, may it be done to me according to your word. And this is what somebody needs today. You need to take God at his word. And he told you you were going to be free. You need to wave your hand and say, I'm free. And he told you you was going to be healed. You need to wave your hand and say, I'm healed. And he told you that you were going to be prosperous. You need to touch your name and say, I'm going to be prosperous. If he told you that you were going to be anointed, you can tell your neighbor, I'm anointed. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more chain. The angel told Mary of Jesus' coming, birthing and emphasizing the role of God's grace and God's spirit, but it also describes Jesus as the Son of God. It announces that he will rule in David's kingdom. One of those women, by the name of Elizabeth, she was too old to have children. The other name, Mary, was just entering her teens, and she was not ready to be married. Some people say she was even too young. But what God does, he often does the impossible and the unlikely to remind us of his power and that he is in control. God is not limited by the laws of science. God is not limited to doubt in human expectation. God is not limited by attitudes and mean mugging. God is bigger than what I ever could imagine. Is there anybody here that knows that if it was up to the scientists you would have been counted out a long time ago. If it was up to your first grade teacher you wouldn't even went to the second grade. But if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side you would be where you are and who you are. Is there anybody here that knows that there is all Always a time because of grace to get pregnant. Touch a neighbor say, let's get pregnant. I ain't talking about pregnant in the birds and the bees. I'm talking about pregnant with the Holy Ghost. Because when the Holy Ghost comes in, he will overshadow you. He will overcome you. And his power will breathe on you. And you ought to be showing in the first trimester. And the second trimester and after the third trimester somebody ought to see Jesus the son of God his name is wonderful counselor mighty God prince of peace he is the rose of Sharon he is the great I am he is a rock and a weary land he is bread in a starving land. He is water in dry places. He is bread when I'm hungry. He is clothes when I'm naked. He is a wheel in the middle of the wheel. He is Moses is rod. He's a David's David in the lion's den. He is my friend. He is my all. My all in all. Does anybody in here know him? If you know him, say yeah.